Jason McNoddle, welcome to the Your Digital Marketing Coach podcast. Hey, glad to be here. Uh, thank you so much, Jason. Um, I know we tried, you know, back and forth finding the time. I know you're real busy, and it it's almost like every day I'm on Amazon looking for a marketing, digital, social media marketing related book. Your name pops up and like 2023 revision. Um, so I know that you are extremely active uh, in many many ways. Uh, yeah. And in fact, in my digital first mastermind community. Uh, actually, a reader. Hey, Charity Boy, always appreciate your chiming in. Uh, that there, uh, she's actually reading the book we're going to be talking about today, which is uh, practical or the social media marketing workbook. I'm still working my way through your Google Ads workbook, uh, okay. 2023, and uh, yeah, I, I love um, just you're you're bringing this like very very practical uh, education to so many small business owners and practitioners around the world that need it. So before we get back into that though, Jason, I wanna know, I know you teach at Stanford. Um, I wanna know just how all this started. Now, you know, I already have a clue after, you know, reading your book and understanding you actually have a very, very long history in what we would call internet marketing or online marketing, yep. but I'll let you take it from there. Uh, yeah, so, um... I, uh, yeah, I go way back. So I uh, built my first website in 1994 and I, I had a tech company and that's what got me into websites and SEO and um, how websites become popular through search engine optimization. And then I'm a recovering PhD. I have a PhD from University of California, Berkeley. So go Bears. So I think that's where I get a lot of my like kind of like intellectual philosophical vibe to what I do. Uh, and then in 2008, I, I started teaching um, SEO, social media, and AdWords for a company in San Francisco. I sort of kind of reconnected with some friends of mine from Harvard. And that's how I kind of got re, re back into this. And then what I realized is like, you know what I really liked in graduate school was I liked the teaching and the discussion and the explaining things. And what I hated was like the petty politics. So I was able to kind of pull that part of my career back in. Um, and then since then, I've done really well. I have really popular books. I teach for Stanford Continuing Studies. I meet a lot of people and I enjoy just kind of taking the concepts of digital marketing and explaining them and helping people sort of have a framework to understand them. And then I'm also very kind of practical. I like to actually do it and get it mm -hmm. done as opposed to just like a ivory tower pontificate about it. So that's kind of how I got into it. And, I, and that's, that's kind of my career path. So before this started, you mentioned PhD at Berkeley. What subject matter was that in? <laughs> I'm assuming it wasn't directly related. <laughs> no, this was kind of before the internet, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's funny how things work, though. So I finished my PhD in 1992. And if you really want to know the, 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 the idea, I wrote my PhD on economic utopianism in Eastern Europe. So <laughs> wow. So really very academic, very weird. It does, I could explain why it relates to what I do today. But here's sort of a funny story. I did a little book in uh, 1992, 93 on doing business in Hungary. I did it with a co-author and we emailed copies of the book between Budapest and Berkeley uh, through, uh, you know, this is right at the beginning of the public internet. And we were able to use email to send the book back and forth. So I go way back on the internet to like the really early primitive days. And I think mm -hmm. I started to like have the cogs in my head, like this is going to be really cool for business. Right. And so that's kind of my uh, backstory and how, how I got interested in this. Yeah. I was in college in the late eighties and I remember going to the computer center mm -hmm. where we had our printer that we printed from our room. And there was something, I believe it's called Usenet. I had mm -hmm. friends at Berkeley at the time and we, uh, that was like email, right? right? Correct. So kind of there, I mean, I would not say I created the internet with Al Gore, but I was kind of there at the very early stages. And I worked, uh, subsequently, I worked at a media company in San Jose and started to see like that the internet was going to have a huge impact on media and publishing. So I have a lot of background in media, publishing, mm -hmm. advertising, and obviously this has been a revolution in all of those areas. So that's my background. Uh, and how I got into this. And how, I, I love it. I love it for that reason, I think. Well, I want to ask you, when you took on your first client, so I began more as an intellectual networking, get to know people, share my knowledge. And then I these companies reach out to me. This is January 2010. Completely different industries. 
they knew they needed to do social media, but they didn't know what they needed to do. Uh, they didn't know what they didn't know. And they just wanted my help and how I could help them. And I'm assuming that you probably got in the same way. You had these companies reaching out to you. They knew you were knowledgeable about it. How did you, like, how did that first start for you? So, so my first relationship was with companies in what's called the embedded systems markets. This is a very techie. Now there's this thing no called way. I, IOT, Embedded Internet of Things. So you did you know parts? Jerry Fiddler by chance? The name rings a bell. Yeah. Yes, I used to work at Wind River Systems. There you go. Okay. Yes. I know yes, the market yes. well. <laughs> yes. There you go. So that was my original group of people that I worked with. Small world. Uh, and sort of, I don't even remember the name of the woman, but when Wind River launched their first website, I was launching my first website. And I remember working with her. And we were really excited when we got a, a, a graphic image to show up on our website. Okay. That is so <laughs> like, and Jason, that is, thank you. That's because... a very small community. And then those people, yeah. <clears throat> some of those people helped help me sort of transition into search engine optimization and were oh. some of my first clients in helping them with, with all aspects of digital marketing, advertising, and ultimately social. So I it, that's my background. Yeah, Jerry Fiddler's the CEO and founder of Wind River. And yeah, yeah I mean they they added TCP IP to an OS and it could network, and that was the beginning of IoT. That's um and right. I worked for them right. back in I want to say 2001, 2002, 2003. And we were talking about it then, right? That all they these aver they, they advertised on the website that I ran. So I had a, I ran a web portal for embedded engineers and they were one of our advertisers oh, before wow. they were acquired yeah. by Intel. So yeah, yep, yep. it's a small, so I was really lucky to, you know, it's kind of the Bay Area community, the embedded systems community. Uh, and then uh, that part of the business kind of went under in 2008 there was a lot of like transformations obviously and then i was like you know what there's a lot of other industries that need this information and this knowledge and then i basically kind of abandoned the embedded systems industry and now my clients are largely small businesses at this point uh who who need seo social media ads the whole kind of kit and caboodle of internet marketing and then i write books on the topic and teach classes on it yeah, that's really interesting. You know, I'm, I'm going back. It was actually 2001 when I left Wind River and it was right when Linux was coming out and embedded Linux was coming out. And I thought that this is going to transform the industry and it may not be may not be in a good way for Wind River. That's when I went to a uh, embedded Java middleware company called SBL. Um, okay. And then I as well in 2008 said, you know what, there's got to be more industries, bigger, bigger fish in the sea. Uh, and I left sure. that as well. So it's, it's interesting. Yeah, how the, uh, yeah. yeah. How, how the yeah. I, I don't have any of those clients anymore. Yeah, yeah, I'm completely out as well, but still keeping yeah. touch with some friends there. But all right. So uh, moving from embedded operating systems <laughs> uh, to helping the small businesses. And obviously right now you're a proficient writer of books. When did that start to happen for you? When did you write your first book? Yeah, so I was, uh, so I'm a big believer in uh, what's called like a, I think it's called, it's not called habit stacking, but it's like skill stacking. So if you have a skill in one area, and you add on a skill in another related area, you tend to get more, you know, more value than just two X. So for instance, mm -hmm. I have a lot of knowledge on these key pillars of digital marketing, search engine optimization, Google ads, social media. And I think because I have a PhD and I have a background in academia, I have the um, understanding and the skill set for how to publish books, how to create like long form book content. And so when I started teaching, I kind of looked around at the available like materials to teach a class with. And I was like, you know, these suck, right? They're just <laughs> dumb, right? They're useless. Um, or they didn't exist either or, you know. And so I basically realized, you know, I could take my class notes and write a book and that would help me teach my classes. And then I put that up on Amazon really without thinking about it. And I, you know, everyone has their own skill set. I suck at accounting. And uh, my bookkeeper said, did you know that you made $30,000 on royalties from your book last year? And I'm like, what? And so, so then I became much more serious about it and uh, realized that there's a good solid market for people that want workbooks on these topics. And that's how I, I got it. So I, among my skill sets, I understand like how to write a good book, how to put it on Amazon and how to influence Amazon. Uh, in a positive direction to kind of showcase my book. So there's a lot of skills involved in book publishing and I um, am lucky and fortunate to have had good experience there. And, and people like my book. So fortunately, I, a lot of 
positive reviews and positive feedback and they're far from perfect, but I do find people enjoy them and get a lot out of them. So, so that's, that's kind of how I got into the whole, my little niche is like these workbooks. Yeah, no, it's awesome. And so what was the first book you wrote? And then do you even remember all the different books you have out there? Cause you have so many. Yeah. So the first book I wrote was the SEO book. I wrote a book on SEO called SEO fitness workbook. And it was kind of on the, I like analogies, kind of analogies like getting physically fit. That book has since become the SEO workbook. That was my first book I published. Uh, and I think my second book was on ads. Uh, and then I have my social media work. Those are my three books. And then I have a book on just marketing, so just generic marketing. And sort of funny story, I wrote a really weird coloring book on Donald Trump. And um, right when he was, first became president and that book bombed. And I spent about $3,000 promoting that book. And my daughter, who is a super lefty, and it was a politically agnostic book. So, you know, uh, trigger warning. It, it's not like pro-Trump or anti-Trump. It was just like, how is this weird Trump phenomenon? It was, I think it was me processing, like, how did this guy become famous, right? Um, and that book completely bombed. And that was sort of a fun little story. And my daughter always gives me a hard time, like, hey, dad, how'd your Trump book do? <laughs> like, it really <laughs> and went nowhere. <laughs> it was That's a really stupid, embarrassing uh, book that I published at the time. So. So, so three main books and you keep them well revised. And, yeah. you know, when I wrote my first book back in 2009 on LinkedIn, it's like, I'm done. That, that was like, my, like, a, like a, a university thesis, right? And then I saw people coming out with books like always revised, always up to date. And that concept of revising books is so important, obviously. The yeah. book is going to run. It's, it's not evergreen, even though the content might be. There's always going to be newer books and what have you. So at, at what point did you realize that you should probably upload a revised version? And then what is, are you basically these three books you spend the year oh, updating yeah. each one of them? Yeah, so I revise. So now I revise the books twice a year. I do a quick revision in the summer. I do a big revision in the fall, and it is a massive pain in the rear end, right? So everything yeah. changes. Um, you know, the the superficial level sort of changes. The the deep kind of philosophical, like why are we doing this level, doesn't change. But yes, I do update the books, um, and it is a huge amount of labor. And there's some strategy, which I think about, like, what is kind of evergreen and what is changing. And, and this sort of brings me to one of my frameworks that I try to get people to understand. So I, I try to explain to people who are doing digital marketing at a technical level, if you know the question, you can find the answer. And here's what I mean by that. You can have a technical feature such as what? Something super simple how to pin a post on Facebook. Once you realize there is a technical feature, how to pin a post, you can Google the answer. And with a few good Google tricks, like looking for content in the last year, you can find articles, YouTube uh, videos, et cetera, that will show you how to do it. So one of the frameworks I try to convey uh, to a small business owner marketer is become aware I have a question and now I want to know the answer. And this is a really useful tactic. So right now, we're, I think we're all suffering through the transition to GA4, which mm. is dog do, in my opinion. So we're all being forced into GA4. And there are lots of GA4 questions like, how do I set up a conversion in GA4? Mm -hmm. Or how do I uh, create a report in GA4 for zip codes? Once you know these questions, you can Google the answer and God bless each and every person with a YouTube channel and a blog. They're often answering those questions. So, so some of the technical features, it's more important to just realize what, what are you trying to accomplish? And then you can find these answers through the internet. But what I find is a lot of people don't even formulate the question. Mm. So they're stumped, right? They don't even have, they don't even understand the question. Now there's a whole other backstory as to, you know, what are we trying to do with Facebook? What are we trying to do with GA4? And that's where those are evergreen concepts, you know? So um, to take GA4 as an example, which is, you know, Google's new version of analytics, you know, what are, what are things that marketers want to know? I want to know how many phone calls did I get last month? I want to know, did these phone calls originate from organic traffic, from SEO traffic, you know, from uh, ad traffic, from Facebook, 
And once you know those questions, you can start down the rabbit hole of how do I use GA4 to answer these important metrics for marketing? So that's, that's a skill I try to teach people. Yeah. You know, it's a skill that I think most, uh, most digital marketers and content creators have, but probably outside of that sphere, it, it's not a skill that a lot of just normal people have. And it'll be curious. I mean, I don't think we need to go into the chat GPT rabbit hole, but it's just easier to, I don't know if the answer is going to be correct or not. We do have hallucinations and I don't want to get, I don't want to get lost in that. Um, but I, I agree a hundred percent. And, you know, Google is really great at these featured snippets of giving you the answer without you even have to click a link, uh, right. which, you know, for SEOers, that's, uh, might be a, another, uh, debate, but anyway, I want to focus on, uh, the social media marketing advice, um, you know, best-selling author of this social media marketing workbook. And before we started this interview, there were a few things that, you know, we wanted to make sure that we talked about. One was this conceptual framework of social media being the party. So I'd like you to sort of cover that and why that's important to understand. Yeah, so I think it's really important. So one of the afflictions of modern marketing is people are just running around doing all of this crazy stuff. You know, they're tweeting ad infinitum and they're posting stuff on Facebook and they feel like, oh my God, here's TikTok and we've got to be on TikTok. And they're just in this kind of content rat race where they're just like creating content and doing all these insane things. And they have no strategy. They have no vision of what they're trying to accomplish. And I'm trying to get people off of the rat race and into some kind of a framework, right? So I find that if you say to the marketing manager, right, which could be the marketing manager, could be the small business owner, you say, you just, you know, hold on a second, right? What are you trying to do? You, you are trying to create a party on social media and it's a party with a purpose. So you're trying to create a fun event where people are going to show up spontaneously, have a good time. And while they're having a good time, you're going to kind of mention, hey, by the way, this is our brand. And it'd be really cool if you bought our stuff. And to go back to embedded systems, right? Sort of funny that you used to work for Wind River. So I was at a party once from Wind River. It was back when I was more of a journalist. And they had in, introduced some new product and I, this is burned in my head and they had a party, they had a, a party at the embedded systems conference. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of in the peak, like peak uh, euphoria, like 2000, like 1999, right? Their money was just flowing like water. And so they had Curacao martinis and I love to drink, right? I'm not an alcoholic, drinking's bad, you know, all that kind of stuff, but I love a good martini. And they had, they had a, Curacao martini and you went to this party and they had really expensive liquor and they it was like their tornado product yep. and they poured the Curacao martini down an ice sculpture that spun the Curacao martini and he had this nice beautiful blue martini that you drank okay so they provided a party with liquor and food and entertainment and good times and then about you know midway through they're like hold the presses the CEO or marketing manager, product marketing managers get up and they say, here's our spiel about our new product, right? And so they were using mm -hmm. the bait of liquor, food, entertainment, Curacao martinis, ice sculptures to get people to come in, but it was a party with a purpose, mm -hmm. right? And that analogy, I think is very helpful to people when you're thinking, why the heck am I on Facebook as a marketer? Why am I on Instagram? And what am I doing? I'm, per, I'm I have invitations. I have content, which is like food and entertainment. I have a brand identity and I have a purpose, build my brand, create some buzz, ultimately sell my stuff. It helps orient people so they don't get lost in this blizzard of, of technical stuff on social. So I've, I've used that framework in the book. I find it very helpful to, to orient people because people are very disoriented uh, today. They're just doing a lot of useless stuff with no strategy, right? And so that's the, that's the framework. That's the meta framework to the book. Uh, and, it, and it's got lots of sub items like first and foremost, content is like food and entertainment and you are producing mm -hmm. content 
for your audience and it better be yummy and it better be good and people better like it and it better fit your brand. And ultimately it's the bait. It's the way that you're leading them to, Hey, get excited about this brand by your stuff. So content marketing is food and entertainment. In my well, I was going to ask you in, in a B2B perspective, and thank you for sharing that Wind River. Yeah, Tornado was like this cornerstone product that they came out with that was going to revolutionize uh, embedded and software. It was a great company. Great company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Time. Nothing lasts forever, but I, I still remember it. I still yeah. remember the Curacao yeah. Martinis. Yeah, that's amazing. I'm just curious, though. So the party, you know, there's all sorts of different companies out there. And I'm just thinking of that B2B company that how can they throw a party? I think for consumer facing brand a lot, it's a lot more intuitive. How, how would that apply to like the B2B party? Yeah. So obviously, you know, in this, again, like use the party analogy. So I always say to people like, there's the party that's the drunk frat party with the people with the things on their head and they're drinking beer and they're getting totally loaded and the police are called and it's insane, right? That's a party. But there's also the party at, you know, at Stanford where we're drinking fancy white wine and we're dressed up in nice clothes and it's a symposium and we're going to learn something about, you know, the history of the Roman empire. That's a party too. Mm. And so your B2B parties are just more on the, on the side of symposium learning uh, knowledge, how to professional development and your consumer parties are more, you know, the insane taco bell, everybody's doing crazy things. Both of those are parties I'm not making a judgment as to which one is better or worse. So the B2B stuff tends to be, you know, more serious, more boring, right? But it's still a party. It's just people are showing up because they are more in learn mode. So, so it still works for B2B. It's just B2B has the challenge of being more subdued. But, but hold on a second, right? We, most of us, we live in a professional capacity where we need to learn. We need to stay up with events. People who listen to your podcast, for instance, are not doing this because this is some crazy over the top, you know, Joe Rogan podcast, right? This right. is more lifelong learning, professional development. And we all have that part in our career too. So B2B is more learn mode. B2C, business to consumer is more crazy fun mode. Both are parties. Just know which kind of party you're throwing. Very, very interesting way of, of looking at it. I love it. I want to get to another point that we were talking about, which is technical analysis. And I'm sure you find, as I do, that a lot of people get lost in the absolute weeds, that, which are so thick and there's so much stuff. Um, and people just are going after the wrong, they're looking at the wrong information, seeking the wrong truth. Uh, I'm curious, is how, do you, how do you simplify this? Yeah, uh, those, so, those small business again, to use an analogy, right? So to use a technical analogy, so you, you're the party producer, you're producing the content, content is your food and entertainment. So let's say you're going to have a party and you're going to have a birthday party. You're going to need a cake. The cake is the centerpiece of the birthday party. When you bake a cake, there's the big strategy, you know, is it chocolate? Is it vanilla? Is it a wedding cake? It is a bar mitzvah cake, whatever, right? You have all of those big picture strategies and then you have very, I don't know, I'm, I'm also a big cooking fan and barbecuing fan. They're also the technical details such as how do you sift flour? How do you, uh, you know, whisk an egg? How do you separate an egg yolk from an egg white, right? So there are these technical things, okay? Now, here's what people get confused about because in social media, in the internet, oh my God, it's, you know, it's, it's abstract, right? So we're lost in abstractions, right? You would never start baking a cake, you know, without a, some type of recipe, with some type of sequence, right? You have to do certain things first, right? You don't do the frosting first and beat the eggs last. You beat the eggs first and do the frosting last. You never put frosting on a hot cake. It doesn't work. So the same when you're looking at technical, it needs to be within a greater context of, you know, pinning a post on Facebook, understand what a hashtag is, running an ad, doing a video, doing a reel, you know, um, going live. All of these things are technical and you have to know how to do them, but they need to be embedded in your larger 
context. And that's where people go astray because it's abstract. People are doing all the technical things with mm -hmm. no conception of how they relate to each other. And so it, it obviously doesn't work because if you looked in the real world, if you're doing the frosting before you do the eggs, it does not work, right? You don't harvest the vegetables before you put the seeds in the soil. But in abstract things, people get confused. Mm. So I find if you give people some simple framework analogies, then they start to go, oh, I get it. There's a sequence of things that have to happen. Mm. And now I don't feel so lost. And my, my wife always makes fun of me because I get these love letters from people who read my books. And they're like, I was lost until I read this. And now I'm like, oh, it makes so much sense. And you're like, yeah, that's the thing. So that I think is a really important part of digital marketing. And I think a lot of marketing really, and the tech companies are the worst, right? Because mm -hmm. they're, you know, look at GA4, right? It's it, Google. It's run by engineers. They have no social skills. They're all billionaires. They don't know how to explain their way out of a paper bag. And there's all of this stuff coming out about GA4 and there's no coherent narrative about what it is as a product and what is it going to solve for you as a marketer. So we as marketers have to take this blizzard of tech from Google and deconstruct it and sort it out and organize it to go, oh, I see what this does. And I'm literally trying to get my head around GA4. I'm starting to go, I understand what they're doing. But they mm. suck because they're engineers. Google is an engineering company and it sucks at marketing. It sucks at explanation because it's just, that's the culture. A bunch of people who are really smart, but they're not good teachers. And, and I think, you know, Jason, we could almost say that about any social network. And it's the reason the why you had to write the books, the right? There's, <laughs> there's no explanations the out there. All the yeah. tech companies really have this problem. So they have that problem. And then to get kind of metaphysical on you, right? They also have the problem that they're all motivated for profit. So they're all trying to, to get you to average. I mean, Google thinks the solution to everything is to run ads and to run even more ads and to spend even more money on ads. And again, when you explain to people, you wouldn't go on a used car lot and say, here's my wallet, sell me a car. You wouldn't expect the used car salesman to be objective. The same for Google or Facebook or Twitter or TikTok or whoever. Their sales staff is geared towards ads, which are great. I love ads. You can do a lot with ads, but be skeptical. This is in my AdWords book. I say it's like liquor, right? Be skeptical about what they're trying to sell you because they have a conflict of interest. I was about to say that exact same word. It's a word that I use a lot. You know, I am like you, we're, we're like consultants and there's a lot of small businesses that I work with where they may be going to an agency and the agency is like, oh, we'll take care of your social media. We'll take, but it, it's a conflict of interest if you don't own that strategy, right? Correct. They're obviously going to recommend things that are going to cost you more money, whether they or not can. they are proficient at it or not. So they once can. you figure I have, that out. I, you know, again, sort of funny stories. I have, I, I can't tell you how many clients, readers of my book, people who've taken my class who say, uh, I had this AdWords account and then I let Google optimize it and it Ooh. completely ran off the rails, right? Ooh. Because they, they have a conflict of, and it's like where I always think like, this is my Berkeley PhD. I'm like, until we have the world communist revolution, stop trusting corporations, right? You know, <laughs> you know go capitalism, yay. But <laughs> be cynical about what Facebook is telling you, Google, Twitter, TikTok, whatever when it comes to those ads. So, so I try to give people a framework, you know, and then I try to it, it, it attach it to the real world, right? You would never go on a used car lot and just blanketly trust the used car salesman. You should never trust the ad staff at any of these companies, of course. And I'm not saying they're terrible people, you know, don't cancel me because I'm like, oh, Google's evil, but, you know, be serious. So, so I think there's a lot of structural knowledge that helps people become better marketers at what they're trying to accomplish. That's what I try to get across in my books and my teaching. Yeah, no, absolutely. So I want to talk about this, this other point you wanted to bring up today, which is the, the concept of recommendation engine, something that I think with the emergence of TikTok, a, a lot of marketers have been talking about, but um, I'd love to hear your perspective on that and why that's really important for, 
for marketers and small business owners? Huge, huge transformation in social media is the transition from what I would call a traditional social media platform to a recommendation engine. And what is the difference between those two structural concepts, right? A, a, a traditional social media is like, you know, Facebook 1.0. You and I are friends. We have a friend request. You post something on your timeline that, you know, you, a picture of your puppy. I see the picture of puppy in my newsfeed and off we go. So I see content because you and I are connected in a social sense. That's a traditional social media platform. A recommendation engine basically says, hey, Jason likes dogs. Jason interacts with dog videos. Jason looks at dog puppies. Jason you know, has posted pictures of his dogs. It figures out that I am a dog person and I own dogs. And it shows me content, not because I'm connected in a social network sense to someone, but because the content itself is, quote, engaging to me. TikTok is the first recommendation engine. That's what TikTok is. It's an AI algorithm, call it what you want, based recommendation engine versus traditional Facebook. Now they're blending, right? There are attributes of both, but the future and the, the trajectory is towards re recommendation engines. Now flip that around as a marketer. That means as a marketer, we are all content marketers today. We are all producing content and we are all trying to create content that's highly engaging, but connects to our marketing goals, build our brand, sell more stuff. And again, talk about structure. You have to understand that the future is now and it's recommendation engines. So as marketers, you need to work on content and not stress so much about like your likes to your page or those, those metrics. Those are not as important as they used to be. And that's, that's the future. And that's where AI starts to come in because the algorithm slash AI are this quasi intelligent learning how to keep people on TikTok 24 seven. So that's kind of, I think such a key watershed. TikTok, you know, social media to me was so interesting because you know, I didn't anticipate TikTok, but when TikTok came along and you start to understand what TikTok means, you realize it's, a, it's like a revolution in social media. And all of the platforms, you know, Instagram, Facebook, whatever, they're all adjusting to this recommendation, right? And here's a fun fact. Again, Silicon Valley is not very innovative. It's not. They're not innovative. Google is not innovative. Facebook is not innovative. YouTube, how did YouTube miss the opportunity that was TikTok, right? Yeah. How, how could all these brilliant people at, at YouTube not understand this? And, it, and here's the, the dirty secret of Silicon Valley. They don't innovate, they acquire. Mm. That's just the nature of the beast out there. Google was a one trick pony and it acquired, you know, AdWords and all this kind of jazz. YouTube, Facebook and, yeah. acquired Instagram, you know, so a lot of this is like, you gotta be careful because the, the innovation camp comes out of left field and that's what TikTok is. Now they're all adapting to it. They're trying to adapt it, but they're not very, these companies are not very innovative. They're not, sorry. Yeah. And I, I think it is interesting for those that are really big in YouTube marketing and do a lot on YouTube that YouTube also has that Very content different. of that. You don't get a lot of views from your subscribers. They tend to come from the browse and all these different features. So they're adapting for sure. Yeah. And YouTube and you know, the big YouTube, Instagram reels and TikTok are all in this video AI, but all of the platforms are trying to move towards this type of suggestive structure. And then we as marketers have to understand that structure and then create content within that structure. But here's the thing. We're not just producing content for content's sake. We're producing content because we want to build a brand and sell more stuff. So back to the party with the purpose, right? <laughs> that Wind River party was not just because Wind River wanted to get a bunch of people drunk and give them a bunch of food. They wanted to talk about their product. Yep. We're all doing the same thing, right? So we're not like, you know, John Doe, crazy bass fisherman on TikTok who just gets a buzz because he has 60,000 views of his video. We're doing it because we're trying to sell something at some level. So you got to keep that orientation 
uh, as you adapt to the recommendation engine world, the AI world that we're entering. Yeah, and really focusing on the content, but also obviously most importantly that purpose and the never purpose. never losing sight of that North Star, right? That's North Star. And it's kind of like, I was thinking it's so funny, like there's the older you get, right? The more cynical you get, the more you see there's nothing new under the sun. So this is all like, if you go to the state fair and you see that, you know, the guy with the infomercial type of like, it slices, it dices, but wait, there are more. That's kind of like all we're producing as marketers is kind of those infomercially. That's really what we're in the business of. And we're trying to get people to stop at our booth, listen to our funny spiel, and, and, and buyer. So there's nothing new under the sun. It just takes a new form when it's in TikTok. And, you know, in a way you could think about like what might come next or something like that. That's why I think AI is interesting. It's a separate topic. Awesome. So Jason, this has been great. Um, and I know that there might be some listeners saying, oh, I wanted more like deep technical advice or tactical advice, but, you know, I have had you know, clients and, and, you know, people I've talked to, they're, they're going through the motion and they're like, well, what's supposed to happen next? Like, why haven't I gotten sales? And, you know, you really have to have, you know, your house in order if you really want to be effective at this. And you've given us some really, really great analogies, really down earth analogies that should hope, hopefully allow everyone to refocus their energies. And, and the fact that, you know, the most boringest industry, I mean, embedded software is one of the most boringest that you will ever find. But the fact that you could do it for that, I mean, that's awesome. Um, Jason, I'm curious, are there any, uh, I guess, what is your roadmap for your books? Do you plan on writing a new book or will your next book be another revision? So I'm doing revisions. I, I'm thinking very hard about creating like a basic kind of primer to marketing and maybe doing a YouTube course on it. So I mm. just think there's a real opportunity and need for kind of like a basic primer, like marketing without BS type mm -hmm. of, of, of course or something. And I, I, I think I'm gonna mm -hmm. do that uh, with a, I've got to get back into YouTube, my own YouTube channel, I think it sucks. I just don't have not had the time to invest in it. Um, so I think that could be an, an interesting because, you know, back to what you said, I'm a believer in the basics. I'm a believer in strategy. I'm a believer in structure. I'm not a believer in some weird esoteric uh, technical uh, little nugget. I, I'm not that that's not me. I think that the for my clients who are small business owners, marketers, like in that small to middle size uh, business area. I, I think strategy, tactics, structure is basics are the, are so high value. And mm -hmm. I, I, I'm not a believer in crazy, technical, esoteric, insane stuff. No, agree. Agree 100%. And I know, uh, you know, my listeners know talking about YouTube that, you know, I, I believe that the blog world I, I get, I've, I've mastered for my purpose and my strategy podcast I'm doing to me and with the emergence of AI and how easy it is to spin text uh, a little bit harder to do audio and video but that's coming I know but in the meantime before it's here video uh, and there's just so much opportunity on YouTube that I see and and it allows us to relate as people which is the most powerful form of communication sure. so so yeah sure. so I'm going uh, as I mentioned to Jason before we started I've been uh, spending the last few weeks really doing more with YouTube and I can't wait to do more in the future but uh, Jason thank you so much Obviously, if people want to find out more about you, they should just go to Amazon, do a search for Jason McDonald. But are there any other websites or uh, you know places you want uh, to send So you? they can Google my name, Jason McDonald. If they listen to your podcast, if they just send me a note, I, I give a lot of books away for free. I just beg for reviews on Amazon. So I have a lot of people that will send me an email and say, I'm stumped on X or Y. And I'll say, hey, do you want a free copy of my book? I'll send it to you. I just uh, please write a review on Amazon. You know, no pressure. If they don't, it's kind of on our system. But they can just Google my name, Jason McDonald, send me an email. And I uh, do try to promote uh, my books in that way. And I, I, I'm I've kind of soft hearted. I get, you know, if you have no money, <laughs> to have no money. I'm just uh -oh. starting out. And you don't uh, want to get I, that started, my friend. <laughs> I, I try to help people uh, in that way. I, I get a kick out of that. So. Well, that's awesome. Yeah. And, you know, also for the listeners, um, you know, the this interview really focused on sort of that framework uh, uh, you know, infrastructure, but, you know, case in point, um, the book, it, Jason's books go into a lot of details. I know it's hard to see here. They go into a tremendous amount of details. Uh, and it really is in this workbook 
um, you can create your strategy as you read the book and continue to flesh it out over the pages. So I really love that stone. I agree um, that that workbook uh, is really needed for people to sort of put pen on paper as to what they want to achieve as they read your book. So well done on that. Well, I'm sure you're going to sell millions more copies. So everybody go to Amazon, pick up one of Jason's books. Uh, if you really can't afford it, you can try to reach out and contact him um, and let him know that you saw him on this, on this video or listen to the podcast. But Jason, once again, thank you so much. And uh, I can't wait to, I can't wait to finally finish reading your book. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank, glad to have you have, have the opportunity.